Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a very serious subject to discuss over the next hour. And let me just preface it by saying that uh, to overgeneralize wildly, there are maybe two kinds of people in the world who profess a disbelief in God. Uh, number one, there are people who just don't want anyone to be Lord in their lives. Uh, they want to do, and uh, this is actually natural for, for us, you know, we want to do what we want to do and not have anyone saying there is right or wrong, anything other than what we decide. And so with folks like that, it's hard to have um, a detailed theological discussion because it just kind of passes by. But there are other people who uh, are serious thinkers and they look at, well, uh, is there a God? Is there not a God? What evidence do we see? How do we appraise this? Uh, and very often, the reason, I saw this in my own students at the University of Texas at times, I've seen this elsewhere, and I suspect you have contemporaries of uh, your age who think in this way also, well, how can there be a God if there is such a great amount of suffering in the world? In other words, uh, someone might say, if you Christians believe that God, the God you believe in is omniscient, knowing everything, and omnipotent, all-powerful, and also omnibenevolent, uh, with love for all, um, benevolence towards all, well then how can these terrible things, X, Y, Z, happen? And that can range all the way from the death of a child to the death of six million Jews in the Holocaust and millions more in the Soviet Union and China and elsewhere. The attempt to explain how in fact these terrible things can happen, but nevertheless, uh, God still reigns, is called a theodicy, namely the, de the defense of God. Not that he needs much defense, but in, so in, in discussions of the sort, in a sense he really does, because people look at evidence of suffering and say, you know, no God. Uh, and thus we come to John Peckham here who's a professor of theology and Christian philosophy at uh, Andrews University and has written uh, a bunch of books on subjects related to this. Um, the reason he's here today, uh, along with uh, his omnibenevolence, I, I wouldn't say necessarily omniscience or omnipotence, but is, uh, is this book he wrote that came out late last year called The Theodicy of Love. And uh, I've dabbled in these questions and thought about evil in the world and so forth. And uh, um, I read lots and lots of books, review lots of books, and this one just blew me away for really at least advancing my understanding of how things can work. Um, so please join me right now in, in thanking John Peckham for coming here, and we'll get into questions. Thank you for having me. Let me ask you first, just for some history here, probably uh, the two most noted developers of theodicies, one a few centuries ago, one more recently. Let me ask you first if you could summarize the thinking of Leibniz. Yeah, so Leibniz is well known as an Enlightenment philosopher that uh, coined the term theodicy. And the basic approach that he has taken is referred to as a version of a greater good theodicy, that evil is in the world to bring about a greater, greater good. In fact, he argued that this world is the best possible world because he thought that God being perfect would only create the perfect world, which would have to be maximally good. Therefore, this is God's world. It must be as good as any world could be. And hence comes the best possible world view with regard to theodicy. Uh, many uh, philosophers and theologians have, have questioned this approach. They have asked, well, it seems rather self-evident that there would be other worlds possible, at least, that would be better than this one, right? Even a world that has maybe one less instance of evil or one more instance of good would be better than this one. So his, his theory in this regard has fallen on hard times, although there's elements of it that are still uh, defended by some uh, in the discussion on the problem of evil. 
And when he talked about the best of all possible worlds, did he mean that it was a perfect world or given the types of things that God might want to bring about, it is a better world than other worlds that could have been created to bring about these particular things? Yeah, he meant that given, given the outcome, uh, given all the factors and what they add up to, there is a greater good overall and there are some goods for which evils are necessary. And so in order to achieve this greatest possible good in its entirety, you need all of these evils. So he's not saying that every single instance is good, but that in an overarching way, this world is the best possible one, that even all the things that are evil lead to this greater good uh, that is the best possible good that God could bring about. Uh, But again, many have modified this view by saying, that there may not be any best possible world. For all we know, there might be uh, more than one possible world that are of equal value, right? Or more than one world are of incommensurable value. And it might be instead that we should think in terms of what some philosophers call feasible worlds rather than possible worlds. And feasible worlds are worlds, worlds that are both logically possible. There's nothing involved in the history of that world that involves a logical contradiction or a contradiction of nature. And uh, when it comes to divine agency, something that God can bring about given his other commitments. So many philosophers like Alvin Planning and others speak in terms of feasible worlds rather than possible worlds. And that avoids the objection that, well, one more good or one less evil would be a better world. Okay, then let's go to the person you just mentioned, Alvin Planning, who's a contemporary theologian uh, and tell us how he advanced this discussion. Yeah, yeah. so I should probably say, uh, for the sake of those that might not be as familiar with his ideas, uh, that when these philosophers and theologians are using the, the language of worlds, possible worlds, or feasible or actualizable worlds, when they refer to a world, they're referring to the entire timeline or all the events in the entire universe. They don't just mean this planet, right? So when they talk about a world, they mean the entire history of God's creation. And they're, when they're talking about possible worlds, they're talking about worlds God, have, God could have created, uh, or if God had done something differently, that would end up being a different world. Even if only one thing is different between world A and world B, they're, they're different worlds in this kind of what they call possible world semantics. So Avon Planning is very famous. Uh, he's famous for being uh, one of the foremost, if not the foremost, Christian philosopher alive. Uh, very well known for leading a renaissance of Christian philosophy along with some other Christian philosophers uh, from roughly the 1960s onward that has really uh, brought back uh, Christian philosophy to the forefront front of philosophy and academia. And with regard to the problem of evil, he's very famous for his free will defense. And his free will defense it basically is, is trying to defeat what is known as the logical problem of evil that you summarized earlier. If God is entirely good or omnibenevolent and all powerful or omnipotent, and there should be no evil. That those three tenets, God is all powerful, God is entirely good and there is evil, is logically impossible, right? Because if God is all powerful, he'd have enough power to either prevent or determine that there's no evil. If he's entirely good, he would want to do that. Hence, there should be no evil. And this is a long criticism, long-standing criticism, I should say. Alvin Planning is famous for articulating in a very philosophically robust way the free will defense. It's, it's not original to him. It goes all the way back at least to Augustine. Mm-hmm. But he articulated it so well that even the vast majority of atheists and agnostic philosophers recognize that his defense defeats the logical problem of evil. And his defense is, is put simply is that if God grants creatures free will of the kind that he calls significant freedom, which means they have free will of the kind that involves the ability to make morally valuable and morally responsible decisions, that if God creates creatures with that kind of freedom, then creatures might use that freedom to introduce evil into the world in a way that wouldn't count against God's omnipotence because he has created creatures with that freedom and wouldn't count against his omnibenevolence if it is the case that a world with creatures that have such freedom is more morally valuable than a world without creatures that have that kind of freedom. So basically, if free will 
is itself a value that, that is so valuable that God is still good in granting it to creatures even if they misuse that freedom, or if there is some other value like love or something else that free will is necessary for, then for God to grant that kind of freedom uh, still leaves him morally good and he can still be omnipotent and there would be evil in the world. Now, Not because he causes it, but because creatures right. misuse their free will. And so when we talk about creatures as human beings using free will and misusing free will, how does that fit in with traditional Christian doctrines of our, of our sinfulness and our sinful tendencies? Yeah, when, when Christian philosophers and theologians talk about free will, uh, they typically distinguish between multiple accounts of free will. But planning as account of free will is a version of what's called libertarian free will. And libertarian free will is, to put it most simply, is a view that creatures have a kind of freedom that their choices are not causally determined by events or agencies external to themselves, right? So given if creatures have that kind of freedom, all they would need to have is the ability to freely take or freely refrain from taking some actions. That doesn't mean that they have free will to do just anything, right? I can't uh, flap my arms and fly right now. Not because I don't have moral freedom, but because I just don't have the ability to do that, right? So uh, an account of libertarian freedom, planning as account of others, is quite consistent with the idea that because of the fall, creatures have an inherited sinful nature, an inherited depravity, uh, which inclines us toward evil decisions. Uh, but given God's grace, given God's reaching out to us, given what some refer to as provenient grace, humans can still have the freedom to make some decisions, even if on some people's account, we're restricted to choosing between God and not God. You at least have some decision. So freedom on these accounts is always limited freedom by definition. The only being in the universe that could have unlimited freedom would have to be omnipotent and that would be God. So anyone else is by definition going to have limited freedom, and sin, sin is going to be one of those limits. And God, while being omnipotent, still cannot do things that are logically impossible. I mean, God cannot uh, turn a square into a circle, let's say, uh, in, that, in that sense. I mean, uh, God cannot uh, uh, do certain things that would be against his attributes. So... Go ahead. Right, yeah. If God were to do something logically impossible, just to, to, to claim that God does something logically impossible just amounts to an absurdity on the face of it. And then you couldn't have any kind of rational discourse or understanding of God at all, and God himself would appear to be irrational. And to take, let's say, an example, I suspect that'll be familiar to most of the people here. Uh, tell us about uh, uh, what kind of uh, free will did Pharaoh in the book of Exodus have as God was hardening his heart. If you could explain how those things work, that would be helpful. Well, there's more than one, there's more than one view of this, uh, what it means in the Bible when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, there's a number of things. If you just look in the narrative, there's a number of features that stand out rather starkly. First of all, God tells Moses that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But then in the narrative itself, it first says, I think, that, God's, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It doesn't ascribe agency. It says later in the narrative that Pharaoh hardened his heart in response to what Moses told him, what, what, what Moses told him that God told him to tell Pharaoh. And finally, later in the narrative, it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. There's more than one account of the way these things can all be true, uh, but the account that I think best fits, fits with both the narrative of the Exodus and the, the larger data of scripture is that God does something of his own freedom and free moral agency, but Pharaoh also makes his own free moral decision to harden his heart. So God does something, namely in the narrative, he uh, acts in such a way that brings Pharaoh to a point of decision. And Pharaoh, he knows what decision Pharaoh will make, but he doesn't compel Pharaoh to make that particular decision. In that way, God hardens Pharaoh's heart without removing Pharaoh's moral agency. But Pharaoh himself still makes the decision to harden his own heart. Okay. So... Um by last fall, I had read a long time in school with some Leibniz. I had read some Platinga. And I didn't have a problem with the existence of evil in and of itself and bad things happening at times to people. And I won't go into all my convoluted thinking about that, but 
that was, I, I could understand all that. The difficult thing for me, in a sense, was horrendous evil. Mm. Uh, not just some evil that's educational, not just some evil that then presses people to do good to fight that evil. There are a lot of other things, but, but horrendous evil where millions and millions of people killed and so forth. Um, and here's where reading this, I think, was very helpful to me, and particularly the way he developed the idea of cosmic conflict, and then within this cosmic conflict, certain rules of engagement. So if you could, uh, you're not standing on one foot, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm not asking you to do the impossible here and explain the whole thing in 30 seconds, but as best you could, if you were uh, on an elevator and you had a several minutes to explain this convoluted, not convoluted, complicated thesis in some ways, uh, take, a, take a shot at it. Okay, so I think the simplest way to introduce the idea of a cosmic conflict with rules of engagement is to uh, mention Christ's parable of the wheat and the tares. If you're familiar with the parable of the wheat and the tares, you have the story that Jesus tells of a landowner, and this landowner sows good seed in his field. But time passes, and there are then tares in his field, which are noxious weeds. His servants come to the landowner and, and ask him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed? Why then does it have tares? Which is basically analogous to the question that people ask in our world today, right? God, didn't you create a good world? Aren't you a good God? Why then is there evil in the world, right? And the response that the landowner gives is quite simple, but indicates what I call cosmic conflict and many others call cosmic conflict. He says, this an enemy has done. An enemy has done this. And if you keep reading, when Christ explains the parable, he clearly identifies this enemy as the devil, that the devil has sown tares in the field. And all throughout scripture, uh, not just in parables, in Christ's temptations, in fact, if you just start reading the book of Matthew, you'll see Christ's engagement with demonic agencies just all the way through the gospel. And you see this also in Old Testament narratives and Old Testament statements. Uh, in Part of the biblical worldview is that there is good and there is evil, and there's also an agency of evil. That agent is created. It's not an eternal conflict between good and evil, but there's a created agent whom we call the devil who was created as an entirely good and perfect being, fell of his own moral freedom, and since ha wreaks havoc on the world along with his minions. That's the basic idea of a cosmic conflict. Now, when it comes to the problem of evil, uh, there are many scenes of the cosmic conflict in scripture where you see that the cosmic conflict is one that is not just a conflict of power. In fact, when someone first hears of a cosmic conflict, uh, if they say God is omnipotent, how could there be a conflict between God and any creature, Satan or anyone else, right? If God is all powerful, he could exercise his power in such a way that there would be no evil, right? So if the conflict is one of sheer power, there could be no conflict. But in the biblical narratives, I think there's good evidence to suggest that this conflict is one of character, not of sheer power, right? There is a question that has been raised, and you see it in places like the book of Job, in many other instances in scripture as well, that the enemy, the devil, who uh, the word devil in Greek actually means slanderer. Hmm. He has slandered God's character. He's raised allegations against the goodness of God and the character of God. And these all kinds of allegations cannot be met by sheer or brute force. Why not? Well, just think about it for a moment. If someone raises a question of your character, right? Let's say you're the, the mayor of this town and someone accuses you of being a corrupt mayor. How much executive power or other power would you have to show to prove that the allegation is false? There's no amount of power that you can exercise to prove the allegation false, right? In fact, show, uh, particular uses of power could actually play into the hands of sure. the allegation. I think there is strong evidence in scripture, and I can't do justice to, to all of it here, but I think there's strong evidence in scripture that there's this kind of a cosmic conflict. A cosmic conflict where the enemy, the devil, who's called the accuser of the brethren, has raised allegations against God's character, and God meets those allegations by a demonstration of character that first legally defeats Satan, and then God will actually uh, defeat Satan by exercise of power. So there's a, there's a conflict here on earth among human beings, and there's also a cosmic conflict 
and this is where it gets very mysterious, involving angels in some way. Uh, and God is uh, demonstrating to angels who may be, in a sense, I mean, you know, speaking in a very superficial way, but who may be on the fence, right, between God and Satan. Satan is contending. Satan is saying, is disparaging God, libeling God, and maybe some angels are on the fence, and God can't show them his character just by slamming Satan down, because mm. that would just actually work mm. to mm. Satan's advantage and perhaps even create some sympathy for him among mm. angels. Mm. Mm. So he has to act in a very different way. And okay, how does, how does God act then, given that, given that desire to make his case before not only humans, but, but angels? Yeah, so, so there's a motif in scripture that this, this world is a spectacle or a theater, right? Paul refers to that. Not only are we being viewed by men, but also by angels. And all throughout scripture, there's also another motif of uh, what some biblical scholars call the heavenly council or the divine council. You see very clearly in the book of Revelation, the heavenly court. In the Old Testament, you also have these scenes like in the book of Job, Daniel 7, uh, 1 Kings 22, many others, where there appears to be God as the ruler, as the sovereign judge, but also celestial creatures, right, that are referred to as the sons of God in the, the narrative of Job, that are also there in what is called a he heavenly council. And uh, in this heavenly council, there are questions raised, there are uh, things, uh, the Satan himself in the book of Job raises questions about God's character and makes allegations against Job and indirectly against God in this cosmic conflict. So there appears to be a question that God is, is dealing with. In order to deal with this question, the only way that God could meet those allegations is if there is some context or some parameters within which the enemy can make his case. So if the devil is raising allegations against God's character, obviously if God was to use all of his power, he could just squash his allegations. But that wouldn't actually defeat the allegations uh, because that would just raise more questions. So it appears, based on the biblical narratives, that God institutes what I call rules of engagement. And these are parameters or a jurisdiction or freedom within which the enemy is allowed to operate temporarily and within specific restrictions to manifest his claims and for his claims to be defeated as it were in a court of law, which actually is taking place in the heavenly council. So this appears in, in the case of Job. If you're familiar at all with Job 1 and Job 2, you have this scene where uh, Satan comes to present himself before God, and there's the sons of God there as well, which is the heavenly council, and Satan basically makes the claim that Job does not really fear God, and he could prove it if he was allowed to antagonize Job, right? Now, this is not only an allegation against Job, it's an allegation against God because God had already declared that Job is blameless and upright and Satan is really undermining that claim. And what proceeds there is a back and forth about the limits within which the Satan is allowed to work. Satan says, if you allowed me to afflict him, I could prove that he's not really who you say that he is. I could prove your judgment isn't really just. Those are the rules of engagement that seem to be there. You have other cases of rules of engagement. Uh, one other example uh, briefly is in Daniel 10, where you have this instance where Daniel is praying. He's received uh, pro uh, prophecies that he, or visions that he doesn't understand. And he's praying for wisdom. And he's praying and fasting for three entire weeks. And finally, an angel is sent to Daniel from God, and the angel says that he has been delayed be, by the prince of Persia, which many biblical scholars think is a celestial being. So there appear to be some rules of engagement, some parameters within which the enemy is allowed to operate. This makes sense of what Jesus says in three different cases in the book of John, where he calls Satan the ruler of this world. Which doesn't mean that God is not ruling, but it means that Satan has some jurisdiction, some limited jurisdiction in the world, uh, which is probably given over to him as a result of the fall. And Satan, with that limited jurisdiction, uh, tries to insinuate in a whole lot of ways to us human beings that there isn't really, that there isn't a God, or that God doesn't care, or that God is cruel. So what are some of, the, what are some of Satan's key devices in trying to malign God? 
Well, he, he does this every way that he can. He twists uh, everything that God says and everything that God does, right? So if God takes an action, he will say, well, why is God acting that way? Or, or why is he intervening so much? If God doesn't, why is he intervening so little? All the way at, back at the beginning of the canon, you have this idea of the enemy slandering God's character. Right in the fall narrative of Genesis 3, you have the creation narrative, it ends, God created everything very good. But then in, in Genesis 3, you have the serpent that comes upon the scene, right? The serpent is there in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't tell you where the serpent came from, but later in the Bible, he's identified as Satan. Revelation 12 refers to this serpent of old, who is clearly the serpent in Genesis. But in Genesis 3, uh, he appears and he's speaking to the woman, to Eve. And basically, he first says to the woman, has God really said to you that you are not to eat from any tree of the garden? Which is almost exactly the opposite of what God said. Because God actually told Adam and Eve that they could eat from every tree of the garden except for one, right? So he's already twisting God's words. So Eve responds and corrects him and says that they're not to eat of this one tree or touch or they will die. And then the serpent says, you surely will not die. Now, at this point of the narrative, someone is lying, right? Either the serpent is lying or God has lied to Adam and Eve. And, and Eve has a choice to make as to who she's going to believe. And the serpent doesn't just claim that God has lied to her. He claims that God has a motivation for lying to her. He yeah. says, you surely will not die. And if you eat from the fruit, you'll become like God. So in other words, God is lying to you and he's lying to you to oppress you. And this is the MO of the enemy all throughout scripture, to slander God's character, to cause creatures, especially humans, to distrust God and break fellowship with God. And he does this in every way that he can. So let's say uh, uh, a child dies in horrible pain and we might look at that and say, well, you know, this shows that either there isn't a God or God isn't in control of the world. And so Satan, we learn from the Bible is malicious enough that he actually takes pleasure in the death of, in the death of children. But that, serves, but, the, but that death serves his purposes twice. I mean, number one, just the, the twisted pleasure in the child dying. Mm -hmm. But number two, the doubt it raises mm -hmm. about God's just, justice and God's kindness. Yes. So we see lots of things like that, that, that Satan can, can attack particular individuals in a malignant way. But there's a greater service to himself that he's serving by raising doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, people used to take Satan seriously, I suppose. There's been a tendency ever since the Enlightenment not to do that. Um, how, how should Christians think this through to try to, in a sense, um, you know, bring back Satan into, into our consideration of things and our understanding of things? Yeah, so there's at least two things there we need to, 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 to try to address. One is, how does introducing Satan help at all, right? Uh, how, how does that help with the problem of evil? And here we need to, I need to just make it clear that when I'm talking about a cosmic conflict theodicy, this cosmic conflict theodicy is building on planning as free will defense, where God has considered freedom, and not just freedom itself, but in my view, love, to be of such value, in fact, maybe the greatest value in the world, that God is willing to give the creatures the kind of freedom that they can obey or disobey God, or love God or not love God. And to not love God is to do evil. If that's the case, then you have a minimal free will defense where God might be morally justified in granting creatures the kind of freedom that leads to the kinds of evils that we see in the world if uh, that's the only way that there can be love in the universe. And if love is the greatest possible good, then God could be morally justified in allowing it. The problem is many, the way many people think of the free will defense is on what I, what I call a two-dimensional level, the level of God's agency and human agency, right? And everything is, you're, you attempt to account for everything by something that God does or something that humans do. But the problem is there appear to be evils in the world that God could prevent without contravening the free will of any human agencies, right? Uh, you could think of, of any, I, I, I want to be very, uh, I want to preface this by saying in the book, and in, when I talk about it, I try to avoid using actual instances of people's evil because even though we're talking about uh, an issue very philosophically, it's a very real problem that brings people uh, great suffering and great angst. So I don't want to use any e examples of real evil as mere anecdotes. 
but if you think of someone, uh, for instance, who died in a plane crash, it, seem, it would seem that God could prevent a plane crash like that without contravening anyone's free will. So for instance, if God can do the kinds of things that he does in the Bible, he could simply warn uh, the, the pilot or an engineer or someone else that this plane is going to crash so that particular steps are taken to prevent it. It seems like God could do those kinds of things without contravening free will. And there's other reasons why a simple free will defense might not be enough, not just to, exp not to explain that there is evil in the world, but the kind and amount of evil in the world, which is called the evidential problem of evil. And this is where I think uh, going back to the biblical worldview is helpful because the biblical worldview has at least three dimensions. You have God does some things, you have human creatures that do some things, and then you also have celestial agencies that are doing some things. If those celestial agencies have some real jurisdiction, if God has agreed for some reasons that we're not entirely informed about to allow Satan and his, his minions to have some limited jurisdiction, then God can't both grant that jurisdiction to them and unilaterally take it back. Well, that would mean that there are some parameters in which Satan can bring about evils that God might not want to occur. He might want to prevent them but he might be morally prevented from preventing those evils given the rules of engagement in a cosmic conflict. And it does seem that uh, it is important to God that people be free to love him because he could have created us as robots, essentially where we could always only do good, but clearly he did not do that with Adam and Eve. They had a, they had a choice they could make. Mm -hmm. We then have choices we can make. Often still we have, we have the bondage of the will, but uh, it's obviously important to God that in some ways we be allowed to fail. Yeah. Uh, and why that is exactly, we, well, we can guess at it. We don't really know, but you know, that's, that's where we are. And I think this is actually bringing back the cosmic conflict into this, which since the enlightenment, uh, we've tended to either ignore or to joke about it, you know, oh, the devil made me do it and so forth. Yes. Yes. Um, it's important to do. And then the rules of engagement are important to do because when God sets up certain rules, that does constrain him. It doesn't mean he's not omnipotent. Mm -hmm. It just means he has set up certain rules and he's good. his word is good. Yeah. So I suspect there are, I would be very surprised if, if among, if among you all, you don't have lots and lots of questions here. And uh, I have some more, but... Um, yeah, let's, let's stop my questioning right now and give you a chance to, to ask questions about some of these things. And who will be brave enough to raise his hand or her hand first? I happen to have a microphone. All right. Um, my, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time and your responses so far. My question is that if Satan has created good, he's created in a perfect environment and, and morally fails, um, now, Scripture speaks to the end of sin and suffering, and Revelation 21 is pretty clear that, that, that Christ's kingdom is eternal. What hope do we really have, though, that um, after Judgment Day, a, in a perfect environment, this type of thing, whether it's a, uh, an angel or, or a human, would fall? Yeah, this is an excellent question, right? So if God grants free will and free will is necessary for, for some outweighing good, whether it's free will itself or some other great good, then presumably that free will would continue in the eschaton in the afterlife. So what's to prevent there being a second arising of this? Well, there's two potential ways that, that, I, that I think we have uh, good reason to believe are likely true. First of all, I think the Bible teaches very clearly that God knows the end from the beginning, right? Isaiah 46, 90 declares the end from the beginning. So I think we can be confident that evil will not arise a second time because God talks about uh, wiping away every tear, creating everything new, and evil and sin will be no more. So just based on God's foreknowledge, I think we can be confident that it will, will not ri arise again. But there's also an element uh, in the, the demonstration of God's character in the cosmic conflict. One of the things that God does, especially in Christ, is demonstrate that he is righteous. If you look at Romans 3, what Jesus does at the cross is as a demonstration of his righteousness, so he can be both the just and the justifier, which is also a demonstration of his love. By doing that, he legally defeats 
the allegations of the enemy. In fact, in Revelation 12, when it talks about Satan being thrown down, many biblical scholars think that that is referring to what happens at the cross. When Satan is finally thrown out of the heavenly council, he's not allowed to make those allegations anymore. He's basically excommunicated because of what happens at the cross. In other words, Jesus has legally and morally won the victory. You can extrapolate from that to the fact that this demonstration of God's character, which reaches its zenith in the cross, right? If God is such a God of love, whatever else you think about God, whatever else you think about evil, if God is such a God of love that he's willing to himself die on the cross, this is a manifestation of supreme love and supreme goodness. This kind of God can be trusted. That kind of demonstration might inoculate the universe from anyone ever even entertaining freely going wrong again. So I think it's definitively answered by God's foreknowledge, but I also think... Uh, the controversy serves to inoculate, the, not the controversy, but God's demonstration of his character in an irrefutable way so that in the end, every knee bows, makes it such that evil will never arise again. Yeah, so it's a demonstration for the whole universe in a sense. And, it is. And I think Platinum at one point says that uh, a world in which there is an atonement and then resurrection and so forth is a, is a better world than a world in which there is no such thing. And, that, and, and in order to get there, you have to have some evil, at least, uh, for an atonement to be something that's even worth doing. Right. This is one of Planning's recent arguments. And even if one doesn't go all the way as far as Planning it goes with that particular version of theodicy that's called Felix Culpa or oh, Happy Fault, that it's actually better in the end, uh, you could still make a case that if there are things that happen in the world that God doesn't want to happen, and I think there's biblical reasons to think that, uh, there's many instances in the Bible of unfulfilled desires where God laments something happening. Oh, I wish this had happened instead. But given creatures' freedom to use their agency the way they want, it still might be the best actualizable outcome that God can bring about through this great controversy. And one thing, at least at the cross does, I think, is it puts forward a kind of proleptic theodicy. That even if we don't, didn't know anything else about this God, that would be enough to trust him that he really has our best interest in mind, a God who's willing to go to the cross to save us. Uh, so uh, we've heard a lot about kind of, you know, what God intends to do and how we can trust him through everything that happens. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the more practical application of that idea. Because um, obviously the plans that God has, they work with everything that happens. Uh, nothing happens without his, you know, go ahead. Um, but how we go forward as part of those plans is something that's a lot more difficult to discern. You look at historical examples like the Holocaust, obviously, you know, God was in control and he was using that, but I, I don't think any Christian would say it wasn't our job to try to intervene and stop that from happening. Um, and especially when we look at more complex ideas about, you know, things that are going on right now, uh, how, how do we discern what is, you know, God's will obviously from what is necessarily good and right and something we should go along with? Yeah. So to address that, I think, so we run the risk if we make the claim that any evil in the world, given the fact that God didn't prevent that evil, it must, must have been some greater good, and that's the reason God didn't prevent it. I think going down that road runs the risk of us falling into the trap that I think Paul would not allow us into, is saying, well, I can just do evil and more good will come from it because if it, good wouldn't come out of it, God would stop me, right? So let's do more evil so good may come. I, I think we can avoid that by making a distinction that I make in the book. I elaborate on this quite a bit in chapter two, between God's ideal will and what I call God's remedial will, by which his will by which he remedies situations brought about by creatures' bad decisions. So God's ideal will is, is what would happen if every creature always freely did just what God wanted them to do. Obviously, in scripture, that doesn't happen. There's divine commands that are disobeyed. There's evil introduced in the world that God says shouldn't occur. So that brings us into the realm of God's remedial will. And the analogy I sometimes use for God's remedial will is, uh, I don't know if, you, if you've seen any of those like cooking programs where you have some chefs and they're in a, a cooking competition and they're given uh, one or multiple ingredients that they have to use. Uh, and then they can make anything they want, but they have to use those ingredients. If God is granting creatures free will, then there would be ingredients, not that he has to use them per se, but insofar as he's, he is committed to freedom with real consequential agency, there are going to be factors introduced into history that God didn't cause, but that he can introduce other things into to bring about the best outcome. So it might be better if those things had not been introduced at all, uh, if the, the horrendous evils in the world had never occurred at all, and yet God might still be able to bring goods out of them. 
So evil itself wouldn't be necessary for good, and therefore we shouldn't do good to bring about evil, but God might be able to bring good out of those evils. And there might be situations, if it is true that there are rules of engagement, any given instance of evil, there's at least three reasons maybe why God doesn't prevent it, right? Number one, it might be the case that if God were to prevent that evil, it would contravene the kind of moral freedom and agency that God has committed himself to giving, right? Or it might be that if God were to prevent that evil, things would end up being worse in the long run in ways we don't fully understand. Or it might be that God has given a kind of agency and jurisdiction to celestial creatures, the rules of engagement, that if God were to prevent that, it would contravene those rules of engagement. Uh, in any of those cases, it's not, it's not necessarily the case that God needed these things to happen or wanted them to happen in order to bring about a greater good. It might just be the case that it's not within, there's no preferable avenue from God's perspective given his commitments because it might contravene freedom, it might go against the rules of engagement, or it might lead to worse outcomes. But that doesn't mean that it's better for us not to stop it. So there may be a whole host of evils in the world, and I think there are, that God would rather have not occur that we could stop, but it might not be within the rules of engagement temporarily for God to stop. So if a cosmic conflict is correct, then we actually should be living in a world in a way to bring about the best goodness, the best justice. And we can know what that is in broad strokes based on what God reveals about himself in the Bible, about what is goodness and what is justice and what is mercy. Yeah, and we can learn what the Bible says about human nature and we can learn the history and so forth. Um, you know, if you have a professor who gives you the same lesson time after time after time, but you don't absorb it uh, at a certain point, uh, you can see the professor will be rather exasperated. I mean, we've had, you know, the 20th century uh, that, that uh, you all maybe only had uh, a couple of years in, uh, basically, if you're, you know, age 20, 21, something like that, was, so, was such an educational century in terms of, if you have countries that, that put uh, Darwinism with survival of the fittest into practice, and they think they're the fittest of all and thus they are able to destroy other countries, or if you have uh, you know, the other 19th century figure besides Darwin who was most influential, Karl Marx, and you put his thinking into, process, into practice, I mean, you see what happens. You see that millions and millions of people mm. are killed. Uh, and you know, we, we saw that in we saw that in Nazi Germany, we saw that in the Soviet Union, we saw it under, in China under Mao Zedong, uh, we saw it in Cambodia, more recently we've, we saw it in Cuba, we're seeing it in Venezuela now, and yet, here we go again with, um, you know, de with crying out in favor of socialism and Darwinism and so forth. I mean, we're doing, we're doing the same thing, so why, why don't we learn from the past? What is that? What's, what's, what's going on here that we just seem unable to absorb these lessons from both history as well as from what the Bible talk, tells us about human nature? Right. I mean, I think the Bible just tells us, to put it as simply as possible, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I think you yeah. see in the world in many different ways, a host of different ways, just the outworkings of evil and evil even in, even in the human heart. That even our minds are clouded and sometimes ignorance is willful, sometimes it's not. Uh, but... So it's not necessarily that God is hardening our hearts because that we are hardening them ourselves, so as, as we're the Pharaoh. But, right. God does some things, and we also have decisions to make yeah. that, that he's yeah. often uh, displeased with. Yep. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for coming out. Um, I had a question about what God does, what God wills. Uh, does that mean that there's things that God desires but doesn't actually will? and that there are things that God desires more than his other desires, and therefore wills some things instead of others? Yeah, so you have to, def it depends on how you define the terms. Uh, so I define God's ideal desires as equivalent to God's ideal will. And that's what God would want to occur if everyone did precisely as God wanted. That's what he ideally wills. But it is true that, if this, if this view is correct, that God has some things that he values for which other things are necessary. So let's say it is the case, I make an argument for this in the book, but let's just say it is the case that love requires morally significant freedom, 
or the freedom to do otherwise than God wants. If that's the case, then in order for there to be love, at least love relationship between God and creatures and creatures and other creatures, there must be this morally significant kind of freedom. But that would mean that creatures could use that freedom in a way that God doesn't desire. So if, if it's God's desire to consistently grant this kind of freedom, then yes, creatures could do something that God doesn't want, but he permits them to do that for this greater desire, so to speak. And that's what brings us into the realm of God's remedial will. That's where God works with the free decisions of creatures, including the bad decisions that he doesn't ideally want. And he adds to those his own workings, his own willing, his own actions uh, around those to bring about the best course of history that is possible given those bad decisions of creatures he doesn't want. Yeah, thanks for coming out. I was just wondering... So I'm really intrigued by this idea that Satan's rebellion is not so much a military uprising in a sense that it's a challenging of God's character. Yeah. So when we, we look through the Bible and it talks about how Satan isn't necessarily just saying that he wants God to step down from his position, but yes. that Satan himself, as he says, I will become like the most high. Yes. So would you say then that the devil is in fact thinking that he would be a better God in a sense, like a, a more righteous, depending on whatever his version of righteousness would be. Is, is that kind of what you're saying? That seems to be one of the claims he's trying to make, right? So you have what you alluded to in Isaiah 14. You also have in the temptation narrative in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, you have one of the temptations, one of the three temptations the devil brings to Christ is um, he shows him all the world and all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, if you just bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms, right? Effectively saying, if you just bow down to me now, you don't have to go to the cross. I'll give you this entire world that, that you're coming to save. And in, at least in Luke's account in Luke 4, uh, Satan actually claims, I, this world has been given over to me and I have the power to give it to whomever I wish. And yes, he's trying to usurp God's authority and God's throne. He's trying to get Jesus to, to bow down to him because all throughout scripture, all the way to Revelation, he's trying to be the one who is worshiped and effectively take God's place. Now, of course, that's delusional and crazy, but this is this is the result of evil. Evil itself is irrational and delusional. But the way that Satan does it, because he obviously cannot rise to the level of God, he does it by trying to knock God down. And so he's consistently slandering and undermining God's moral government. One biblical narrative example that's somewhat analogous, obviously every analogy breaks down very quickly, but if you know the story of David and his son Absalom, uh, what does Absalom do to try to overtake David's throne? He sits at the gate of, of the city. And the gate of the city is where judgment took place, by the way. So people would bring their grievances and he would sit there and say, if I was king, things would be better for you. If I was king, things would be better for you. This is essentially one of the things the devil is doing all throughout scripture. If I was in charge, uh, if, if God was, if, if I was in charge, I'd be ruling better. That's not the only way he's doing it, but, but there is that consistent thread throughout scripture. He's also a terrorist. He'll blow up people in order to get yes. his way and so forth. So. Yes. He doesn't play fair. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so my question is about um, God's justice and how that plays into this. So one thing that I'm a little confused by is why we need a better explanation for why there might be easily preventable evils in the world when we can just say, well, it's God punishing people. So for example, if there's a lot of people dying or suffering, um, given that they all deserved it because every person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, couldn't we just say this is God exercising his justice in the world uh, and he will likely do it uh, in the afterlife as well? Why isn't that a sufficient explanation even under a free will paradigm? Uh, and more generally, um, what do you say to the scripture verses that seem to indicate that God allows evil to happen precisely because he wishes to exercise justice? So, for example, you've got, uh, there's a verse in Proverbs that says God um, creates everything for his own will, even the wicked for the day of judgment. There's, a, there's verses in Romans that talk about the potter and the clay and how uh, the clay can't complain if it's destined for judgment um, in order for God to show his justice. So how would you respond to that or uh, put, fit that into your framework? Right, good. Great question. So first of all, there's another kind of live option theodicy that I didn't really mention, and that's a view called skeptical theism, which basically takes the view that uh, even if we don't find any defense or theodicy compelling, uh, that's still not good grounds to disbelieve in the existence of God because we're mere humans, God is God, and we shouldn't expect to be in a position to understand why God does what he does or 
doesn't do what he doesn't do, right? So God may have reasons that we don't know about, and that might be sufficient at the level of defense. I just think Scripture says a lot more than that. When it comes to divine punishments, there, there, there are indeed, at least in Scripture, uh, instances of divine punishment. Uh, but that would not be ex- able to explain all of the suffering in the world, because if there's even one instance of undeserved suffering, then you would still need a theodicy that goes beyond that, right? You'd need an account for why innocents suffer. Uh, of course, no one is innocent in a broad sense of moral depravity, but there are many people who suffer for things that uh, I think you could make the claim is, is deserving, sometimes undeserving, and sometimes egregiously undeserving. So you would need other streams to account for that, unless you're going to appeal to skeptical theism and says, well, God knows, and I don't expect to be able to know, right? And there is that. There is that even in the Bible. This is part of what, is, what God's response to Job is, but it's not the entire response, right? Were you there when I created the world? Uh, you, don't, you don't, basically, in, in one verse, one translation is, why do you talk so much when you know so little, right? And I think all of us need to be humble and recognize that even our best answers are only going to be partial answers. When it comes to language of potter and clay and and God willing things for particular purposes, uh, there's more than one way way to look at that. One of that is to say that God is causing all these things because he wants to have them happen. Another way is to say that God knows what creatures will do. He grants creatures the freedom to do what they themselves want to do. And then God brings the best good out of those decisions that he can. If he has exhaustive definite foreknowledge from the beginning, he could, still, he could still say that he willed this for that, but that wouldn't necessarily mean that he actually ideally wanted this. It might be that he remedially wills this given the decisions of all other creatures. Creatures, And I think that's what's happening in the potter and the clay. The potter and the clay metaphor in Romans 9 is actually taken from the Old Testament. And one of the, one of the most striking instances of potter and clay is in Jeremiah 18, where Jeremiah is told, go look at this potter and the clay. And God says, I'm the potter, this is the clay. Amar appears in the clay, but God refashions it. If you continue reading Jeremiah 18, in verses 7 through 10, God goes on to speak to Judah, and he says, if you relent of your evil, I will relent of the disaster I planned. Conversely, if those who are doing good relent of their good, I will relent of the, of the, of the blessing, right? In other words, even embedded in the potter and the clay imagery of Jeremiah 18 is this back and forth give and take where God is responding to the free decisions of agents. So the very metaphor itself it involves this kind of moral freedom. And I think Paul is using it that way because just in the book of Romans, you have consistent appeals to moral freedom. So I, I do think uh, this, a cosmic confidence account actually encapsulates all of these biblical texts in a way that, that makes good sense. And, and Jesus uh, refers to specific personal and historical examples. Uh, the man born blind, why? Was yes. it his, his sin or the sin of his parents? Yes. And no, it's, it's so that, that God can be made manifest in the world. Why did a tower fall on these people? Uh, you know, why was there this, this accident, it seemed? Uh, or why did, why did Paul kill these people, uh, uh, Pilate kill these people and, yes. and use their blood and so forth? No, so that there's an education that takes place in this. So it's not, it's not always that you can attribute bad things happening to people because of their sins. Right. Uh, there are other things going on. Right, yeah, he directly says that in, in Luke, where he yeah. says, you know, do you think that these were worse than all the other right. people? I tell you no, but repent lest something yeah. worse happens to you, by which he means being, being lost eternally, yeah. right? Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming by. I just wanted to ask you a real question as to how many limitations would be placed on our free will before we don't really have free will anymore? So I can't jump six feet into the air. The reason for that is because unfortunately I'm only five foot five inches tall. Mm -hmm. Uh, God created me specifically to be this height and specifically the ability to not jump that high. That's probably not a limitation on my free will to say you no longer have free will, Mm -hmm. but how many of those sorts of things need to happen? How many limitations have to be put on us before we no longer have real free will? Is it just the ability to make any moral decision ever, or is there something broader than that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Many philosophers distinguish between... uh, what could be phrased as the internal ability to make free decisions and the external ability to bring those decisions about, right? Um, You could have uh, internal ability to make decisions uh, and you could have the freedom to actually exercise that agency restricted and you could still have free will. How much free will, uh, how broad the limits need to be in order for there to be genuine free will? Well, they could be very narrow and you would still have at least one instance of libertarian free will in a purely philosophical sense. But when it comes to God's design and God's purposes, it appears that those limits have to be at least broad enough for there to be free, loving relationships. 
And that seems to require, I make an argument in the book, that seems to require some consistent parameters of freedom, including freedom to believe or disbelieve. The technical term for that is epistemic freedom. And they need to be relatively consistent. I won't claim to know exactly where they're drawn, but this is because love cannot be compelled. So, so a thought experiment just to get out what I'm trying to get across here. Um, before I was married, if, if I wanted my wife to love me, I could not force her to love me, right? But let's say that I could control all of her thoughts. Would she then be free to love me or not love me? Of course not, right? She wouldn't have the kind of freedom necessary for love if that kind of freedom is actually necessary for love. So if God is allowing that kind of freedom, there must be freedom for creatures to believe or disbelieve even God. And God must grant that consistently because uh, every action that creatures take is going to bear on whether we trust God or not. So I think, without knowing what those parameters are, that God gives the kind of freedom necessary for love relationship to flourish maximally in a perfect world, and he doesn't change those limits, and he covenants to grant that much uh, freedom consistently. And since we're made in God's image, we also want to be loved rather than control someone robotically. I mean, any one of you is thinking getting married, you may really want a particular person to be in love with you, but I doubt if you would be satisfied if, if, you had, if that person was robotically controlled by you. It would, it, it would, I don't think it would, it would satisfy your deepest desires. So. Other questions? We are almost out of time. Maybe... Um, well, let me, let me then ask, uh, where does this whole discussion go from here? In other words, uh, I, I, really, I really think this, uh, this book, Theodicy of Love, advances the discussion. What's next, either in your own research or in the research of other people or the thinking of other people? Uh, is there a, ne a next step that you can see at this point? Yeah, there's a couple of next steps I would like to take. What I'm working on right now is a constructive treatment of God's attributes, articulating the way God relates to the world as a God of love. And there's a lot of overlap between the kind of God that God is, the way he relates to the world with his attributes, and the problem of evil. Uh, so many things in this book about God operating covenantally will appear in that book, and they will mutually support one another, I hope. Um, I'd also like to kind of follow up on the, the final chapter. The final chapter goes through some live auctions in theodicy, uh, some strengths and weaknesses of a cosmic conflict with rules of engagement approach, and then some ways in which I think this approach might hold some advantages in advancing the conversation. Uh, but that's a very brief chapter, and each, each view is treated very briefly. It would be nice, I don't know if I will ever be able to do this, but it'd be nice to do something that takes those particular views and uh, devotes a more focused treatment to each one in conversation with cosmic conflict mm -hmm. and shows maybe what some of the advantages and what directions the conversation might be advanced uh, by uh, actually entertaining this robust biblical and traditional concept of cosmic conflict. And then how do you bring this out of the academic discussion into a general arena or do you? How does that work? Yeah, it, it's always easier said than done, but usually uh, I... I caution everyone to recognize that when people are going through acute suffering, either their own or someone else's, usually the last thing they, they need yeah. or desire is a kind of theoretical explanation about why that occurred. So the best thing you can do is what Job's friends initially did. If you read Job, they sat for him with a week without saying anything. Then they opened their mouth and got <laughs> themselves into a lot of trouble. Right. right. So the best thing you can do for somebody who's suffering is show you care for them and have compassion for them. That's not to say that trying to wrestle with the problem of evil is worthless even to them. There may be a time in their life later on when they've been able to work through some of the raw suffering where they are trying to reconcile it with faith or come to God in faith, where they do need to go through that journey of how can we make sense of this if we can make sense of it. And when they're open to that, that might be the time. And also when people go through suffering, if they already have a conception of God, so they're not assuming God is doing this to me, that might help them deal with the suffering. But the problem of evil and suffering, the ultimate solution to, to the problem of evil is eschatological. By that I mean only God can solve it, and he will. Not just theoretically, he will remove evil forever. And so what I point people to is number one, we don't know everything that we think we know. There are some good parameters like free will defenses, like cosmic conflict. I think the Bible tells us a lot about them. But in the end, if, all, if nothing else, we should look to the cross. Mm 
and the one who is willing to go to the cross for us, we can trust. In fact, Jesus, Jesus himself appeals to this parable of the vineyard owner in Isaiah 5, where the punchline of that, par- that, that, that song of the vineyard owner is, what more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not done? And this is God speaking about his people. What more could I have done that I have not done? Jesus picks up on that in a parable that he tells about a landowner who sends a number of servants and his servants get killed one after another by those who are trying to take over his vineyard. Finally, he sends his son and they kill his son too. And the hanging question of the parable is, what more could he have done that he has not done? Even if we don't understand why God is doing this or not doing this, the question we can ask, if a God who is willing to himself suffer and die for us in the person of Christ, what more could he do that he has not done? We can trust a God like that even if we don't understand. And I think that's pastorally uh, where I want to start and end with Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Please join me in thanking Dr. Peckham. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.